So journalists must, one, know their rights, two, not wait for other lawyers or other people to come and defend them. They must themselves begin to defend their rights, claim it and defend it. If you do not know your rights, your employer will abuse you, the state will abuse you, the police will abuse you, anybody will abuse you. So the owners, first and foremost, other than look out for other people and blame them for not doing enough, journalists must look inwards and ask themselves, do we know our rights as a journalist? If I go to cover a press conference, am I doing it as a privilege or as a right? What is my right as, as a profession, as a journalist? If you know those rights, then you're able to defend it and claim it, uh, even before other people come to your, to your rescue. As a human rights lawyer and as a human rights organization, we have done countless things to defend the rights of Ugandans, including journalists. There are several journalists we have represented in court. We have challenged media laws that we think impede on the rights of journalists. We are part of the legal team that is now challenging the, 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 the tax on social media because we think it impacts on the practice of the professional journalist. We have challenged restrictions on cyber laws. You perhaps know our most famous case is representing Facebook in the case against Fred Muema in Ireland for uh, the disclosure of the identity of, of, of Tom Kualinga Voltaire or TVO. So we have done tremendous uh, amount of work in defending the space for free expression and the practice of journalism. We've also provided trainings and information about rights that journalists should actually know in the conduct of their profession. Because it is one thing defending the rights, it's also another thing being able to empower people to be able to one, recognize what their rights are and two, two, to defend those rights themselves without necessarily requiring lawyers. I mean, there are several cases, and first we must highlight the point that journalists are not just journalists, they're human rights defenders within the definition of the UN, uh, uh, the UN guidelines on human rights defenders, or the UN declaration on human rights defenders. So journalists are human rights defenders and must be treated as such. There's just no two ways about it, because they are devoting their time to peaceful activities in defending human rights. And so human journalists are human rights defenders by any definition and deserve our protection. Now, in terms of the specific journalists that we have assisted, many of you recall about two years ago the arrest of Joy Doreen Bira in Kasese, simply because she pointed her camera at UPDF soldiers killing people in the king's palace. Joe was arrested. Joe was being prosecuted. We defended Joy. But beyond defending Joy, we provided services to Joy Doreen Bira to make sure that she's protected, to make sure that her equipment was returned from the police. We took almost a year to get back her equipment from the police. In fact, the last thing that Felix Kawesi did for us was to return the camera uh, memory chips and other equipment belonging to Joy Doreen Bira. And she has benefited grossly from that. There have also been cases of journalists that we have provided what we call agit attention calls from all over the world through Amnesty International to protect them from, from intimidation. Many of you perhaps have no idea, but Dr. Stella Nyanzi is first a journalist. She went to a journalism school with Andrew Mwenda at Macquarie University. We have provided a defense for her we have provided protection for her. We provided safety for her. She knows that when she's in problem, she'll call us. She knows if she needs a security service, we'll give it to her. But we've also placed journalists at the disposal of human rights protection mechanisms. Many of you perhaps do not know about an organization called Defend Defenders that has provided safety, security, physical security and safety to countless journalists across this country. A lack of knowledge and awareness about, one, your rights as journalists, two, the enforcement mechanisms for defending that right, and three, what your roles are in defending that right. A journalist by the names of Ronald Senbusi, who has now died, uh, may he so rest in peace, was arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced by a court of law for reporting a case in Kalangala of district officials stealing iron sheets meant for the poor. He had no idea that he had a right. We took on his case, 
His case is still pending at the East African Court of Justice to challenge the practice of trying journalists for the offense of criminal defamation. So journalists must, one, know their rights, two, not wait for other lawyers or other people to come and defend them. They must themselves begin to defend their rights, claim it and defend it. If you do not know your rights, your employer will abuse you, the state will abuse you, the police will abuse you, anybody will abuse you. So the owners, first and foremost, other than look out for other people and blame them for not doing enough, journalists must look inwards and ask themselves, do we know our rights as a journalist? If I go to cover a press conference, am I doing it as a privilege or as a right? What is my right as, as a profession, as a journalist? If you know those rights, then you're able to defend it and claim it, uh, even before other people come to your, to your rescue. First of all, before you're a journalist, you're a Ugandan. You're a human being bestowed with the right, and among other rights, to peaceful demonstration, to influence government on any policy matter that you want to, you want to influence government on. So it is within the rights of those who participated in the, in the demonstration, including the journalists themselves, to exercise that right of peaceful assembly and demonstration and to influence government through peaceful and civic activities. But I think it is even more important for journalists because the impact of this tax will, 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 will affect the practice of journalism. We are moving to a, a period of what we call citizen journalism, where journalists rely on citizens to get news tips, to become sources for information. Social media is now a space for breaking news, where journalists go and access breaking news and then go and investigate it. So any journalist worth his or her salt who is interested in protecting the practice of journalism must be concerned about the impact of this tax on the practice of their profession. So those journalism, uh, those, those journalists, uh, Raymond Majuni, Joel Sonyoni, deserve our applause for taking the bull by the horn and defending the profession, besides exercising their own right for a very long time, they have been peddling a narrative that social media is a space for spreading false news, is a, sp a space for spreading pornography, but more importantly, that social media had become a space for organizing against government. So the actual intention, the unstated intention of leaving this tax is to limit access to and use of social media as a space for organizing across the country. And, and government has limited space for, for demonstrations. And to be able to demonstrate now, you need a police permission. They have limited the space for free expression in media houses. The next step is to limit the space for free expression online. And social media being the most popular space for organizing is, is definitely a target. So the intention really is not what is stated by government. It is what the impact of this law is, namely, limiting the space for organizing uh, across the country, especially amongst young people. Social media is a space, it's a platform that has been used by many people for private business, especially young people, for accessing information, for imparting information. Many people across this country receive vital information about services, about health, about education, about trade on social media in their different uh, forms, whether WhatsApp groups, Twitter, LinkedIn, or the various platforms you have. So social media as a space has been a force for good. And so many people have used it uh, to reach out to so many other people across, across the world. Imposing a tax on this will limit the ability of these people to use social media uh, to deliver the services that, that they do deliver. In specific reference to legal services, the best example is an organization called Legal Brains Trust. An organization called uh, Barefoot Law, actually. Barefoot Law exclusively uses social media to reach out to SMEs, small and medium enterprises, to provide them free legal advice on how to conduct business, how to register a business, how to draw contracts, how to resolve legal dispute. 
over 3 million people over the last two years have been reached by Barefoot Law using social media. Just a group of lawyers sitting in a room, getting online, using social media to provide pro bono or free legal services to so many people. These people who are providing this information will be affected by the tax. But the people who are going to be most affected are those who are receiving this information. Poor farmers who are receiving information about climate change, about rain patterns, about soil quality, are going to be impacted. They will not be able to access this information, or if they are able to, to do so, it will be very limited because of the cost implication. In specific reference chapter 4, chapter 4 uses, uses social media to provide free legal services to people across the country, in fact across the world. Many of these people cannot afford to pay the five cents a day or the 20 shillings a day tax to use social media. So we are going to be impacted, but the people who are going to be impacted the most are those who benefit from our services across the country and across the world. We must differentiate between two things. Yes. Access to the World Wide Web or the Internet, which has been declared by the UN Human Rights Council as a basic human right and access to social media as a platform. The number of people who are online might be a whole lot more compared to the number of those who are using social media. Remember that certain phone service providers provide social media for free, so you don't have to be online to access social media. So there are many more people who are on social media in their different forms than those on the web. And to maintain a tax is not just to limit the enjoyment of that right to access social media and the internet as a whole but to make it a privileged right for those who are able to pay it will exclude from this platform the poor or those who are unable to pay this tax so the actual impact of this tax really beyond just access to information is exclusion is to make social media a tool for those who have money and only those who can i i, I are able to pay it is to lock out the very poor from accessing social media as a, as, as, as a platform or as a service. And we've got to make a, there's a legal distinction here. The access to information right, as expressed in Article 41 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, limits access to information only to access to information in the hands of government or government agency or government department. It only applies in respect to information being held by government. So both Article 41 and the Access to Information Act regulates or expresses regulations on information in the hands of government. But the broader and wider interpretation of the right to access to information is not limited to access to information in the hands of government. The right to access information has been interpreted internationally to include the right to access information and the right to impart information, to receive and to give out information. So using the international best practice and interpretation of the right to access to information, which is much broader than what we have in our law books, by imposing this tax, what you're doing is limiting the people's ability one, to receive information from whatever source that they want to receive it. But two, and more importantly, to limit their ability to impart information. But beyond the remits of the right to access information, information and access to information is also a means for the exercise of civic rights or the exercise in one's governance. And so once you limit access to this information by means of imposing a tax, what you're in fact doing is by extension limiting the participation of the people in their governance uh, and in civic activities.